Now today, as we're gathered across all of our campuses, Pastor Reward Sabanda is gonna bring the message. We're continuing our Lost Art of Friendship message series. Now, Reward is new to our staff. He actually just came on staff. This is gonna be his first message as a staff member here at Saddleback. And I wanna encourage you, as he talks about diversity and God's design, making us different from one another, how that makes us better together. I wanna encourage you to lean in, to let God speak to you. And let's give him our full support. So to all of our campuses, let's put our hands together and welcome Pastor Reward as he comes to bring the message. <laughs> Come on, Saddleback, let's go. And I love uh, Pastor Andy and Stacy, and it's such an honor to be here and to call this family. So uh, truly excited. And if you're joining us from our campuses or uh, online or even our extensions, uh, welcome uh, to the third week in our uh, Lost Art of Friendship series. Now, I'm excited about this particular conversation because I get to do some really cool things. I get to introduce y'all to some of the most awesome people that I know. And the first one is this man right here, and his name is Ronnie Brock. This is Ronnie Brock, y'all. Ronnie Brock is a senior leadership at World Vision, and uh, Ronnie Brock lives on about 400 acres out in Oklahoma. Uh, he's an oil man, he breeds cattle and everything, a very distinguished man. But the truth of the matter is, this is really Ronnie Brock, <laughs> right? This is how he is when you find him day in and day out. Look, look at this. If you are wearing a jacket, Ronnie Brock will be wearing that jacket when you come back. He is one of those people, I don't know if you guys know people like this, that are committed to debasing themselves and they will take you down with them. That's, uh, that's who Ronnie Brock is. And uh, he, is, he is a great friend. So Ronnie is always playing pranks. On me. I still remember like just a few of these. Uh, there was one time we were on a flight and he got on first. I'm sorry, I got on first and I'm sitting down and Ronnie comes down the aisle and then he has this smile. I'm like, oh my gosh, Ronnie, what are you going to do? And the moment he gets to me, he's like, wait a second, are you a reward, Sabanda? Then he's like, everybody listen, this man is a patriot. And then he goes, hey, that one interview that you did on Larry King, was one of the best interviews that I've ever seen. Hey, can we give him a round of applause? And I'm over, if I could blush, I would have, y'all. It was the most uncomfortable flight ever. I still remember this one time we were in Africa and uh, we were running late for another flight because that's what you do when you're in Africa, right? And uh, you love it the whole time. But we get there, but Ron has flown so many times and he has so many miles. So he goes in and he gets to check in before everybody else, but he knows, man, my, my friend's not gonna make it. So right there in the middle of the airport, he starts screaming, cousin, cousin, and everybody's looking around. And then he looks at the guy who's helping him. He's like, hey, can I, can I bring my cousin? And the guy's like, your cousin? He's like, yeah, my cousin. He's like, sure. He's like, cousin, come up here. So I show up and I'm like hanging my head in all of my melanin. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Ronnie looks around and everybody's looking, going like, okay, how are they cousins? And Ronnie goes, he's like, our grandfather was in the war. <laughs> and everybody cracks up except the, the ticket guy. But Ronnie's constantly uh, doing things like this. This one time, I still remember one more. I'll give you guys one more. Where did pastor? I'm at a pastor conference, like dignified stuff. And uh, it's one of those, and Ronnie calls me. He's like, hey, I, I got to tell you something really important. Are you by yourself? I'm like, no, there's just a few people around. So he starts whispering. I'm like, what? He's like, hey, put me on speakerphone. And so I put him on speakerphone, and the moment I do, it's like, hey, your parole officer keeps calling me. What are you doing? Man, I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I, I dropped that. But Ron is the type of person, like his life philosophy, true story. This is what he tells his kids all the time. It's hilarious. He's like, hey, the worst decisions make the best stories, and safety lasts. Like, that's literally what he's saying. And if you met his kids, you would know, because they've gone on to do incredible things. But he's not just a goofball, though. I still remember one time I called Ronnie, and I'm freaking out because we're about to have our first son. His name is Celia, and I'm like, hey, am I going to be a good dad? Ronnie, talk to me. Tell me something. Like, what if I raise, you know, like uh, the next nuisance? Or, am I going to be good? And I'm freaking out. 
And Ronnie goes, and, and, and it's like a call, and Ronnie slams his hand on the table. It's like, you know what? Nobody ever takes care of the daddy. It's all about mommy. You know what? We got to change that. And he just hangs up. And I'm over here, and I'm thinking, you know what? We got disconnected. It's like, whatever. We're right there in the delivery room. And all of a sudden, I hear, hey, um, your cousin's here. And I'm like, what? I don't have a cousin. They're like, yeah, I, we know. But he says he's your cousin. And so I'm like, okay, fine, let him in. And Ronnie comes in, and he had left, driven three hours, got a shirt made, which says rewards daddy doula, and he brought a barbecue and Dr. Pepper, and he was like, I'm just here to be your doula because everybody cares about this. And it was a funny thing, but it was one of the most meaningful things that he could have done in that moment because I really needed a friend. But the funny thing about it is, Ronnie is what you call a surprising friend. Everybody say surprising friend. So that's the conversation we're going to have today because I know all of us have the type of friendships to where you're like, man, I could have never put this guy from Oklahoma with this guy from Texas, you know what I'm saying? And so the people, but he is one of those, people would have never thought this 60 plus year old and me, but the Lord has done incredible things with surprising friendship. And in this conversation today, I want to ask you, what would happen if we really leaned into the beautiful things that God has for us on the other side of a surprising friendship? Now, I'm not talking about shady friendships. That's a whole different sermon for a, a different day. Because I know we all have, you know, some friendships that we should stay away from. I mean, as crooked as a ghetto tattoo. That's not what I'm talking about. The ones that I'm talking about are the ones that really add value to your life. And speaking of value, let me introduce you to another one of my friends. This right here is Dr. Patrick Mbande. Everybody say Mbande. There we go. You said it well enough. There's Africanism in you. But this man is, if you watch Star Wars, then you know what I'm talking about. This man is what we call a Jedi. The force is strong in this man. That's another Star Wars thing because this man has a, a, a doctorate in missions. He has multiple master's degrees. I mean, he started, planted 58 churches all over the world which are still vibrant and he provides oversight. He's one of those people. So I go, I have a huge passion um, for church planting. So I go to this conference and I'm sharing my heart and it's well received. And afterwards, this one guy walks up to me and he's like, hey, that thing that you were talking about doing, I actually know a guy who's doing the exact same thing. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, as a matter of fact, the guy's from Zimbabwe. I'm like, no way, I'm from Zimbabwe. He's like, great, you guys should, should become friends. I'm like, I don't know because someone that smart, someone who's done that much, and someone at that level would never be friends with someone like me. Matter of fact, I'd be surprised if he was friends with me, right? But he was like, hey, you never know, just reach out. So I reach out in all humility. I'm like, hey, I have questions. I want to plant churches. Could you help me with this? And so we have a great conversation. And then afterwards, he's like, you know what? Anytime you have a question, just give me a call. I will pick up, right? I mean, true, your boy just jumps all over that. And I still remember I'm calling him every week. And as we're talking, we just developed this incredible friendship. And he's telling me all these things. And it's all about church growth. And we're getting excited. I think at some point, about six months later, he's like, man, you know what? So he starts asking me about me. And he's like, where did you go? I was like, I went to Christ for the Nations. He's like, hey, you know what? I actually have a daughter at Christ for the Nations. So if you're ever there, you should just connect with her. But he never told me how long I should make the connection. So long story short, He's my father-in-law, y'all. And <laughs> that surprising friendship has led to the most incredible things that are happening in my life right now. This is my incredible wife, Pam. And uh, this is uh, my son, Stilo, right here. Uh, they will pop up here in a second. Look at that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but Stilo's favorite pastime is, is pulling my hair. <laughs> But here's the thing, um, I, I, I look at this and I bring these things up because the most meaningful, the most life-giving connections, the most joy-giving things that are happening in my life right now came through the vehicle of surprising friendships. I would, these are people that I would have never, nobody would have ever thought, hey, we can put these two and two together. Right? Surprising friendships. 
But the truth of the matter is maybe, maybe I shouldn't really be surprised because if you think about it, this was God's original design from the beginning. This is God's original uh, blueprint. If we look at uh, Genesis 1.26, right? This is what the Bible says. In order for you to understand anything, you have to go back to the beginning. So in Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. And so that basically means that God is the cause and we're the effect. And the effect will always mirror the cause. So everything that is true about who God is, is fundamentally true about who we are as humanity. So for example, right there it says, and God said, let us make man in our image, uh, plural. So, and we understand that God is one God, one distinct uh, being in uh, one triune being in three expressions. That's who God is. And so in essence, God has always existed in a sense of community. And because of that as humans, we will always crave community. We will f always find our expression in community. If 2020 taught us anything, it's the simple fact that we need other people. I don't care how it, it, it introverted you are, we all need people. Where do we get it from? We get it from the simple fact that God created us God is the cause and we're the effect. And the effect will always mirror the cause. But then the second thing I want to share is this. And it is simply that the values of the creator will be dominant in their creation. So you can look at the things that God created and you can tell what his values are. As a matter of fact, you can do that with anything. You can look at any artist that's ever existed. And when you look at their artwork, you can tell what they value based on what they create. For example, um, I just came to know about this guy, right? Uh, we'll just call him Beard Guy, but his name is Monet, right? And this guy, for the last 30 years of his life, just drew water lilies. Like, water, I'm like, dude, do something new. Water lilies, like 250 paintings of water lilies. I'm like, dude, where was your wife? Because for me, my wife, if I tell three jokes in a row, my wife's like, you gotta find something new, right? But this guy is, you can tell that this guy had an affinity for water lilies, and it's this exact same thing which is true about God. When you look at creation, right, raw, beautiful creation, the one thing that you find more than anything is God's value for diversity, right? It could be the same family of fish, but I don't know how many species of fish there are. Right? It could be the same um, palm trees. I just found out that there are over a hundred species of palm. Everything that God creates it shows his diversity because that is essentially a value that he has. So God creates this and he's like, hey, I will create people to congregate in particular communities, but I want them to fully lean into what my diversity looks like. But if you think about it, this has always been his blueprint, right? If we go to Genesis, let's, let's talk about the church, which I think is the most beautiful expression of the plans and the purposes of God. Right? When you look at the church in Genesis 1, so God creates this incredible diversity, including us, right, in his diverse image. And then we see the church in its most vibrant, in its most life-giving and life-filled iteration in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. It's the first big multi-ethnic megachurch. What am I talking about? This is what it says. It says, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So it's almost like when God was saying, I want you guys to see what the church could be. He brought people from every nation and tribe and tongue, and they all gathered together. And we see this beautiful mosaic and this motif of the diversity of God, deeply imprinted in the creation that he created. And then we go to the book of Revelation, right? The triumphant church. At the end of it all, Revelation 7, and this is what it says. This is how it describes the beauty and the ethnicity and the diversity of the church. It says, after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. So it all ends with all of us, washed by the blood of Jesus. Every nation, tribe, and tongue, all worshiping together. So if 
it was always God's design to in the beginning in the book of Genesis, we're created from diversity for diversity. If the first expression and iteration of a vibrant church was diverse, and if the end of it all is a church diverse, united by the blood of Jesus, loving and serving one another, then why is it that we find ourselves still stuck in our own little microcosms and in our own little tribes because we're very tribal beings and we're always on the outside looking in, missing out on the beautiful blessings and the diversity that comes from leaning into friendships that look nothing like who we are. What if we leaned in? What if we said, hey, because all of us here can tell stories of how, yes, God has blessed you through your community, but every single one of us here has a story about how God used people that didn't look like you, that didn't come from where you came from, to truly be a blessing to who you are. As a matter of fact, the reason I'm standing here before you is because about a year ago, God took a guy from Africa, that's me, and he took a guy from Texas, and we all met in a place in England. And when we were there, we created a community of friendship with a couple from the Bay Area. And in the end of it all, we all found ourselves here doing God's incredible work. Because when we lean into the hard work of surprising friendships, God does incredible things when it comes to that. Now, listen, I'm not naive, right? I'm not going to act like um, it's easy. And the truth is, it's very convenient. There's something beautiful uh, about when you are around specific people and they speak your language and you understand things and you have inside jokes and you don't have to explain things. And because of that, as humanity, right, we gather towards each other and we become very homogenous in that simple aspect. And so God creates us as people of community and we've always congregated in community until Jesus shows up. And he completely shatters that paradigm. And Jesus shows up and he completely switches our mindset on what it looks like to only hang out with the people that look like us. Because if you want to be honest, <laughs> Jesus had some pretty um, interesting friendships, right? I mean, yes, Jesus had incredibly diverse friendships. I mean, he was friends with uh, religious leaders, but he was also friends with fishermen, right? He was friends with the rich, but he was also friends with the poor. He was friends with people of power, but he was also friends with downtrodden. So Jesus was always standing in the middle and, being, and, and, and having interesting friendships with everybody. But then it's also true that Jesus had some really surprising friendships, right? Some friendships that you're like, ah, I don't know about you, but if I was the Messiah, I wouldn't hang out with those um, professional criminals that you hang out with. I don't know about you, but if I was the Messiah, I wouldn't be hanging out with crooked tax collectors. I don't know about you, if I was the Messiah, I wouldn't be hanging out with all the surprising friendships that you hang out with Jesus. So Jesus had very interesting friendships, but I think the most surprising friendship of all is found in the book of John. Let's go there for a second. Uh, John 4. And this is what it says. It says he, it's talking about Jesus. He left Judea and he departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So the moment I read this, I was like, wait a second, that, that doesn't sound right. See, because when you geek out on the Bible, uh, you geek out over maps, yeah, I'm that guy and everything. So, so this is a map. So Jesus was going from Judea to Galilee, and the quickest way is a straight shot through Samaria, right? A to B, boom, like me explaining something to my wife, right? It's very straightforward. It goes there. But the Jews would constantly take the long route. Come on, Pam, explaining things to me. They would either go all the way on the other side or all the other side, and they would completely avoid Samaria, and they did this because they considered the Samaritans half-Jews because they had intermarried with all these tribes and their religion had kind of seeped in. So they considered the entire region unclean. So why is Jesus finding himself compelled to go through Samaria instead of going around like a good Jewish rabbi? So I'm reading this and first of all, I'm like, okay, that's strike one, Jesus. And so let's keep reading. 
So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Wait, wait, wait. That's two strikes right there in the same thing. Because first of all, uh, Jewish rabbis don't just talk to random women. It just never happens. But on top of that, it's not just any woman. This is a Samaritan woman. So that's two strikes. Just, I'm reading over there and I'm like, what is going on? And then it says, and Jesus said to her, okay, now he's talking to this woman who is a Samaritan. I, I don't know about this, Jesus, right? Let's keep going. And then he says to this, give me a drink. And the moment he said that, I was like, okay, something is off. Because, hey, uh, the Jews were people who were ceremonially clean people. So when it came to, um, uh, to eating with Samaritans, they never did that. They never shared any utensils because the moment that they did, they were considered unclean. So they would have to go to the priest and uh, give doves and do sacrifice. It was highly inconvenient. So for you to be a functional member of society, you had to keep yourself clean. But we find Jesus, and I like what it says, needing to go through Samaria, going and sitting at a well and having a conversation with this woman. And I love what it says, he needed to go there, because what it shows is that whenever you have to lean into having surprising friendships, it is always going to be from a place of conviction and not convenience. It's not going to be easy. But look at the beauty that lies on the other end of that. I don't have time to get into the story. But if you read the story, you see that Jesus then becomes engaged in this incredible conversation with this woman, which goes deep very quickly. And she lets out all the secrets of her heart. And they have a conversation. At the end, she is so overwhelmed by Jesus' goodness that she leaves everything, runs into the city, says, hey, come see a man that told me everything that I did. Could this be the Messiah? Then everybody invites Jesus in, and he comes in, and he preaches the gospel, and the entire city comes to a saving knowledge of God. What incredible things can God do through us when we choose to lean past our bias and past our comfort zones to lean into conviction and say, hey, maybe across from me in that surprising friendship is something that God wants to do, which is incredible. Now, once again, I, I'm not assuming that it is going to be easy. I know that there are some people here who are like extroverts and who are like um, Enneagram 7 personalities, and they're like, I don't need this. I got it. Let's go. Let's lean into surprising friendship. But there's a lot of us which are just like, hey, you gotta have to keep me, you got to have to give me the steps, right? You, you're going to have to teach me how it is to walk into these things. And so as I was reading this narrative between Jesus and this woman, I cleaned three specific things which I want to share with you when it comes to this. Things which will help us, like I said before, right, to stop looking from the outside, looking in, and really lean into doing the good work. And the first thing that I want to say is sit at and set surprising tables. See, now, in this particular story, it's not a table that we're sitting at a well, but that's where a lot of social interaction would happen. But the truth of the matter is, in our day and age, we understand the power of the table. So the table is almost metaphorical, in a sense, to represent acceptance, right? To represent contribution, right? I mean, how many of you guys have ever sat at a table and ate with, ate with people that love you and that celebrate you and that know your name and they do all of these things? There's nothing more powerful than sitting around a table and doing all of this. It's so good that it is literally, the Bible talks about, when it talks about the goodness of God, it says he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Because how many of you guys, you've had a bad day, and at the end of the day, you know you're meeting somebody for dinner, and the moment you slide into that booth or sit at that table, all of a sudden, you know you're going to feel seen and heard and all of that. And so the beauty of finding a table is you could find that table with people that don't think look, sound, or even act like you. So the first thing I want to say is sit at surprising tables. Now for me, um, I came from Zimbabwe, and I don't know if you guys are really good with your geography, but everybody over there looks like me, right? They talk like me. So I had no frame of reference for diversity until I came to the U.S. and I met uh, Pastor Ray Hogan. 
Now, I was going to throw up a picture, but I don't have a picture because Pastor Ray Hogan doesn't take pictures. But if you could think of Pastor Ray Hogan, if I were to ask Chad GPT to, to conjure a picture of him, it would look like a cross between Yosemite Sam and Chuck Norris, okay? Because he is the manliest man I'm talking about. I'm talking about he had a handlebar, like mustache, because it said Roosevelt had a mustache. He had a full beard, right? He never cried. He just watered his beard. You know what I'm talking about? He was that man. He was born in Kentucky, but he was forged in Texas. He was that guy. He taught me everything about it. He loved God and he loved wrestling. And which, by the way, I never got wrestling. He tried to get me into it, but I was like, hey, it's two guys without pants fighting for a belt. How does this make sense? But anyways, that's wrestling. I never got into it. But I still remember one time he shows up to your boy and he's like, hey, Sabanda. That's what he used to call me. I'm like, yes, sir. He's like, uh, you want to go to a potluck? I'm like, huh, a potluck? Because see, the only potluck I knew is the Zulu potluck which means if there's anything in the pot, you're in luck. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, oh, I don't know, potluck, what's that? He's like, well, a potluck is when people, and he's like, you're going to love this. It's when all the best chefs from every culture all bring their food together and they put it on a table and you just show up and you just eat to your heart content for free. Now, the moment he said free, he had me, but I was skeptical. See, see I think on my tombstone, it's going to say where the food was free, there we would be. I mean, I love, I love food, but I love, if someone asked me, what's your favorite food? I said, free food. Come on, somebody. It's a culture of that. The reason I got saved is they were trying to share the gospel, and they're like, at the end of it, we all sit down together, and we eat, and we feast. I was like, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Right? I love what it looks like. But he tells me about this. He's like, no, no, a potluck is where people, can, but he could kind of see I was skeptical. He's like, wait a second. You're not a vegan, are you? I'm like, what, vegan? What is a vegan? Oh, no, I'm Baptist. I don't know what a vegan is. He's like, no, a vegan is people that don't eat meat. I was like, wait, you mean like food atheists? And I was like, wait, basically, I have a problem with people that cannot do something, and then they all gather together, and they give themselves a name, and they're going to do this. He's like, yeah, no, a, v- a vegan is literally there are people that don't eat meat. And they formed a tribe? Yes. And I was like, I was like, uh, vegan? Oh, vegan. We have a name for those in Zulu. The word vegan literally translates to lousy hunter, right? We all know people like that. It's just like, you know what I'm saying? He's like, hey, 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 vinitive. And she's like, (laughs) missed it by that much. All right, boys, I guess it's wids for dinner again. Then after a while, they foam and try. Listen, I don't want you guys to think that I don't like vegans. I love vegans. I'm... I love it. And I want you guys to think I, I, I don't like animals. I love animals, y'all. I love them deep fried. I love them grilled. I love them roasted. I love all of that. But see, one of those things is, so he tells me about this incredible pot, like, and I still remember I showed up, and I kid y'all not, this was one of the most beautiful and profound and kingdom pictures I'd ever seen. It's people from different tribes and races and cultures and everything. And they're all coming and they're bringing the best of their food. You've been to a pot like you understand what I'm talking about. And everybody brings pride around their dish. And people, it, it's hard to hate someone who makes good food. As a matter of fact, it's impossible. I dare you right now. I want you to try and hate Chick-fil-A. Do it. I dare you. You cannot, because if the food is good, it brings a sense of unity. And so I'm sitting over there with Ray, and we're eating, and we're sitting at this table, and we're asking, sharing recipes, and there's people from Jamaica who brought oxtails, and there's people from, and there's so much diversity, and it's my first time looking at the diversity that is the U.S. sitting at a place to where the kingdom and the church is what's binding, and I could not think of a better thing. And there was such a profound impact of that moment of unity that I still remember in 2020, I was the associate pastor of a church, and they were like, hey, we need a a strategy around all this racial uh, thing that is happening. And I still remember I went back and and, and asked the Lord, and I remember the spirit of the Lord just reminded me of that. He sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. So I just went, and I was like, hey, 
this, what's happening is a family conversation. So we set up tables and everybody would come and we'd eat together and we'd deconstruct all the things that were happening right in our nation. At the end of it, we would all take communion together and we'd worship together because at the end, remember the thing that we do, the thing that unites us is the blood of Jesus. And at the end, we all take communion together, we all eat together and we all worship together. And then we turned around and we told our people, go and set those tables on your social media, go and set those tables in the spaces around you and as they went out, God met them and we had incredible stories because that is the power of diversity around the table. And one of my favorite scriptures is this. Listen, it's Acts 17, verse 24 to 28. It says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all breath and all things. Listen to this. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. From one blood, he fashioned all of us. And based on on the foundation of the blood of Jesus. We can lean into surprising friendships knowing that if he can move in us, he can move in them. And when we come together united with love and brotherhood, we can see God do incredible things. What are we missing out on when we do not lean into surprising friendships? Sit at and set interesting tables. Now, here's the thing. When you get over there, someone's like, okay, great. I show up to your table. Now, what do I really do? And this one right here, this is the most important thing for you to remember. And here it is. Ask dumb questions. Ask dumb questions. Listen, I don't know about you guys, but the one thing that we're all afraid of when we come into context that we're not familiar with is feeling dumb or looking dumb or saying something dumb which could potentially offend that. Am I just the only one who's that way? No, we're just like, I don't want to say dumb. Well, what if I say something dumb? So I want to set you free right now, and I want you to tell you that you have complete liberty to ask dumb questions. And, and here's the thing. Um, there's a Zulu statement which I really love, and it says, you can gauge a man's intelligence by the answers that he gives, but his wisdom by the questions that he asks. Questions unlock incredible things. When you come and people can see that you're asking from a place of authenticity and humility, then you'll be like, hey, you can even preface it by saying, I'm, going, I'm probably going to ask a lot of dumb questions, but I just really don't have friends like you. But whenever you say that, right, people lean into that. And then as a result, because the truth of the matter is they also have dumb questions to ask about you. And, and where, where am I getting this? I, I, when I was in school, um, I didn't pass math, right? I wanted to be an engineer, so that's why I'm a preacher right now. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I didn't pass math. And the reason I didn't pass math is we had a teacher who thought he was funny. He thought he was hilarious. So he'd always explain a really complex uh, question or equation or whatever. And then at the end of it, he's like, okay, you can ask questions. His name was Mr. Moyo. It's like, remember, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There are only stupid people asking questions. And then he would like just crack up laughing and everything. I mean, it might have been funny to him, but it wasn't funny to me because what it did is, and to the rest of our classmates, because what we did is it then fostered a culture to where we couldn't really ask questions. And so we couldn't really learn because we truly learn about life and other people when we are allowed to ask the questions. I still remember one time I knew I was going to fail math, so I went back and I told my mom and I was like, hey, now, is it okay for me uh, to do art? Because I, I don't think I'm going to do math. Now, you never ask an African parent whether you can do art. Because as far as they're concerned, if you're not going to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, uh, then you're just, you've just wasted your life. And so she's like, you want to do art? I was like, yes. She's like, listen, unless somebody brings back cave paintings, no African is ever going to get rich from art, okay? Why do you hate math? Like, what's going on? And I told her, I was like, man, I feel like I can't really pass because we can't really ask questions. And she said this, and it set me free. And she was like, you don't understand. Leaders ask dumb questions. Like, what do you mean? She's a woman of the word. She's like, every time you get the most profound revelation in the Bible, it's because someone who should have known better asked a dumb question. 
How do we know we get a hundredfold in this life? It's because Peter asked a dumb question. He's like, hey, what's in it for us? I mean, we followed you. What's in it for us? Right? This woman in the well, we know this is the first time that Jesus reveals himself to a human as the Messiah. And it does it because this woman is asking questions and he is asking questions. So when you enter into a space and when you sit at an interesting table, you've got to ask questions. Listen to this. Jesus asked 307 questions throughout the Gospels. 307 questions. He asked 307 questions. He was asked 183 questions, and he only answered eight questions. The Messiah, the man who knew everything, only answered eight questions. If they had asked me 307 questions, I would have answered 310 extra credit, just so you can know that I know. But no, it's almost like what he was saying is the most important thing is to ask questions. Because when you do, and you're not worried about posturing to seem intelligent or whatever that looks like, when you're asking those questions, it really opens up for you to talk to people. I like what Walt Whitman says. He says, be curious, not judgmental. Instead of judging people and saying they're this way or that way, invite them to a table and ask them questions. And then the last thing... I you should do when you get to that table is just bring your authentic self, right? People can smell fake. Like, I mean, they've got their fillers. And I know because we're afraid of rejection, we always bring an embellished sense of who we are. But the truth of the matter is, um, if we're genuine, we could even take our fears into that particular conversation. We can preface it by saying, hey, I'm not going to know anything, but I'm just really curious. Whenever we have that posture, People can sense our authenticity, and they do that. And, and, and I love a scripture in the Bible that says we've been accepted in the beloved. So if God has accepted us in Jesus, then we need to take that acceptance into those spaces and then pull other people into the gravity of our acceptance. And when you do that, you'll be amazed not just by how many surprising friendships that you get to be a part of, but more than that, what God does through those surprising friendships. See, this whole time I've been talking about what it does for us. And God will do incredible things for us, but the truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, he wants to do things through us. We've got to ask ourselves that if we don't lean into the inconvenience, if we don't lean into the hard work of forging surprising friendships, Yes, we miss out, but what happens to them? Because the story of the Samaritan woman just doesn't just end there. This woman then goes on, uh, church history talks about how she became um, an evangelist and she went around and she brought, went around the different cities just sharing on the gospel. A broken woman, an ostracized woman, which has happened to meet a man who was compelled to go through Samaria because he knew that more than she needed judgment, more than she was suffering from rejection, she needed friendship. And the truth of the matter is to a very real extent, we're all the product of a surprising friendship. That Jesus, almighty God, strips himself of divinity comes, is born as the son of a Jewish carpenter, lives the spotless life, lays that life down on the simple basis that he desires a friendship with you. And right now, in this moment, you can actually lean in and be called a friend of God. It's in the Bible. Jesus says, hey, I have called you. I no longer call you servants, but from now on, I call you my friends. He said that. Now, I know some people in here are going, yes, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know my brokenness. You don't know my sin. You don't know my addiction. It doesn't matter. That woman was broken. Humanity was broken. The Gospels is full of people who did not deserve the friendship of God. 
But Jesus constantly and consistently leans into the inconvenience. Leans into the conviction of knowing, the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Knowing that on the other end of that is a son, a daughter, a friend, is you. So if you're in this place or within the sound of my voice and you desire this friendship with Jesus, the Bible says all you have to do is believe in your heart that he died for you and he wants to be your friend. Then you just have to confess with your mouth and and say these words that you've missed the mark, you've sinned, and that you want him to wash away all of your mistakes and give you a brand new life. And the Bible says by simply doing that, the blood of Jesus cleanses you And you can be a friend of God. So if that's you in this room or within the sound of my voice, if you guys don't mind, just can you just close your eyes? And uh, I would love to walk you through this, this prayer of friendship. And it's very simple. Just repeat after me. Say, Father God, I come before you. And I've sinned against you and I've missed the mark of friendship and intimacy. I can't fix my life and I've tried. So I bring it to you right now. And I lay it at your feet. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Forgive me of all of my sins. Give me a new life. And make me a friend of God. I ask and I thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer. First of all, all of heaven is celebrating with you. The Bible says there's a giant pot like that gets thrown every single time a sinner repents. But wherever you are, Saddleback is a church that celebrates and wants to walk on this journey with you. So just reach out to us on how you can take next steps to what that looks like. Can we just celebrate our new faith family in this room? And if you don't mind, I have one more conversation uh, to talk to you. If if you guys don't mind, could you stand up with me? And I want to talk to the rest of us that are like, man, I've been friends with Jesus for a long time. I walk with him. I serve at church. I'm in good, healthy, small groups and community. I serve in all of that. Well, I commend you for that and I applaud you for that. But the truth of the matter is we all know how complex relationships are. And I know that there's one of us here, and my simple question for you is, what is your Samaria? What is the broken friendship? What is the hardship that you need to walk through in order to connect with the person who needs your friendship, a person made in the image of God, And I know there's maybe some of us here that I hear you and I hear what you're saying and you've made a compelling case, but the truth of the matter is there's hurt. Or maybe they took advantage of me or or maybe I can't do that. They abandoned me or or they wronged me. The beautiful thing about this is the grace of the Holy Spirit is alive in this moment and in this room. And what he wants to do is he wants to walk you through your Samaria into that place of encounter. The Holy Spirit is in this place right now to, to mend hearts and to, to heal hearts and to encounter people and to, and to help you with his grace. Because at the end of the day, when we lean into the friendships that God has given us, he gets glorified. And not only their lives change, but our lives change. And so if that's you in this room right now, if that's you listening within the sound of my voice, I want you to take a few seconds to just close your eyes and let's just let's just envision that Samaria and ask for the grace of God to walk us through it. If you don't mind with every head bow and every eye closed, let's just close our eyes right now. And just say, Holy Spirit, reveal my Samaria. Reveal that place of pain that I keep avoiding. Just talk to him right now. The Bible says that 
Jesus came to reconcile the world to him, and then he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Maybe for some of us, it's, it's a racial barrier. You just have a hard time reaching out to people that don't look like you. Right now in this moment, the Holy Spirit can help you walk through that Samaria and connect with the people that desperately need to know Jesus through the fruit of your life. So with that say, just give that thing over to him right now. Just let the Holy Spirit heal you and wash over you. Just take 30 more seconds to pray in this moment. And then I'll close us out. Come, Holy Spirit. So, Father, I just come into this moment and I speak to every wall, every callous, every hurt, every scar that is in the heart of your people. And I pray that you would do what only you can do. Heal the spaces and the places we cannot reach. Because on the other side of our healed selves are people that need an encounter with you. So I pray that you would begin to give us the boldness to initiate friendships. Because for some of us, it's fear holding us back. For some of us, it's fear of being hurt or fear of being rejected. Whatever it is, in this moment, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of boldness is in that place. And I love what the Bible says. It says Jesus is standing and knocking the door of your heart. And if you will say yes, he will come in and he will sit, sit with you and he will dine with you. So just open your heart to him and to his healing power right now. And Lord, I thank you for all of my brothers and sisters who have been called to the work of reconciliation. Heal them and walk with them past every Samaria and into a beautiful, surprising, and blessed friendships. We ask and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you guys.